because you're complaining, we're going to make you the sad team. Wait, maybe I should make you the complaining team. No, you're the sad team. Well, him, he's got the blue. Do you want to be a sad team member? No. I wouldn't either. Um, you, oh, which color do you want? Red or yellow? <laughs> I get it, because Declan's colorblind too. Just so that you know, Declan is really colorblind. So when I joke to him about colors, it's because he can't see them. So I'm kind of a mean dad, but it's kind of fun. Okay, so you wanted yellow, right? Okay, so you are... I'm totally blanking out on what yellow is. Okay, so you're the rad. You're the sad. Oh, yeah, you're the mad. <laughs> I don't want to be the sad one. Well, you were complaining, so you're sad. Okay, and... You guys are going to be the bad, okay? So we have the rad, way too cool. We've got the sad, we have got the mad, and we've got the bad. I didn't say you were crying, baby. I just said you were sad. Oh, now we're getting personal. Okay, now the truth is coming out. So how would the rad people, do you think you are way too much cooler than the rest of the group? Yeah, if you're rad, you're way too cool. Have you met people that think they're just way too cool for anybody else at school? Yeah, yeah? they just think they're the, like the most important, like they're the most popular. Have you ever met somebody at school that just is like, they're always bad? They just like, to, they're, they're known as the bad guys? Oh, I know. Yeah, I don't, I don't want names, that's embarrassing. <laughs> how about people who are just always kind of sad? You ask, how you, how is, how's your day going? They're like, oh, it's okay. Do you know people like that? They just are always kind of, I am so happy today. Really? Because you don't show it. <laughs> and how about mad people? Like every time you come around and they're like, I'm going to get you. Do you know people like that? Maybe. A few people. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. Here's the thing. That was exactly what was going on at the time of Jesus. People divided themselves into groups. There was the cool group. There was the, oh, woe is me group. There was the whole mad group. And then there was a group that's like, I don't even care about all of you. I'm just going to be bad. I'm just going to take you all out because I'm bad. And Jesus came and said, you know what? In the kingdom of God, this stuff is not the way you get to identify yourself. You don't get to say, I am too cool, or I am too sad, or I am too mad, or I am too bad. You get to say, I am a child of God. And we are all together as children of God, and all these labels and things that people call you, stop. Because Jesus says, you have one name, and it's child of God, and that's more important than anything else. So we're going to talk about that with your parents as well with this sermon. So let's fold your hands and let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for making me a child of God. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's where we're at today. You notice the colors are, are white today. Last week it was red. Last week Reformation. Today, All Saints. All Saints Sunday, or All Saints Day, is the 1st of November, but we celebrate it after because it's already happened. But today is the day that we remember in the church of all those who have gone before us and that great cloud of witnesses that kind of spur us on and challenge us. It can be a sad day as we think of those who've gone before us and they're now in heaven. Or it can be a day that we go, that's what I'm shooting for, and I'm not giving up. But really, it's a day more than anything about thinking about the dead or the living. It's a day that we begin to think about identity. And how do we identify ourselves? And how do we let others identify us? Because Jesus, in the gospel, in the Beatitudes, as we call them, begins to change the identity of the people who are trying to follow him. Now, these Beatitudes, they're not really, Jesus didn't speak them in this poetic way so that they became a wall hanging or a bloody picture that you hang up and go, oh, they're so sweet. It's not about the, the cleverness of Jesus' preaching. It's a serious identity-changing process that Jesus lays out to his disciples and those that are listening to him. So he has this crowd of people 
up in the, the north shore of the Sea of Galilee that are following him, and he finds this kind of naturally occurring amphitheater. So he goes down by the water, and he's preaching up this hill so that they can hear him, and he tells his disciples, everybody, sit down, and let me, let me talk to you about identity. He doesn't say it in that many words, but this is how he begins the whole what we call Sermon on the Mount. And it has more than just these verses in it. He tries to connect with his audience, and he says, how many of you out there are feeling kind of beaten down and feeling poor in spirit and like there's just no energy in your life? Raise your hand. So they all, you know, raise their hand. Well, how many of you are feeling just full of grief? There's been a tragedy in your life or you're stuck somehow in your grief and you can't get beyond that. If so, raise your hand. So some raise their hand. And how many others of you out there are feeling like you just can't speak up for what is right because if you do, Rome will arrest you and crucify you and it's going to hurt? Well, some probably raise their hand as well. You see, he lays out where are you identifying in this whole identity thing today? Do you feel under Roman persecution that you are grieved you've lost a loved one or you've lost your freedom or you've lost something, all you peasants who are listening to me? Do you feel beaten down and so you have this, this broken spirit? Or do you feel like you just can't speak out because if you do, you're going to be chastised? Because let me tell you, that's exactly the identity you are carrying then if that's where you say you are feeling and that's, that's what you think your life is filled with. We do the same thing today. How do we identify ourselves to the world? Widow, widower, addict, in recovery, father, mother, grandfather. What is it that we identify to the world? Are we in a, a cool group? Are we in a sad group? Are we in a mad group? Are we in a bad group? What is it that we show to the world? Because that really is the identity that you believe you are. What are you showing? Who do you identify with. And that's where Jesus starts with his audience that day. Are you grieved? Great. We'll deal with that. Are you feeling like your spirit is broken? Great. We'll deal with that. Are you feeling as if you cannot speak out because you're just so beaten down? Great. We'll deal with that. All of you thought that identity were going to change today. And then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, how many of you are hungry and thirsty? Yes, are we getting that whole 5,000 food thing again? Because that's why I'm here, because I heard that you do a really good job with bread and fish. And Jesus comes and says, uh, actually, are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness? What? I was just in it for lunch. And here's how Jesus says the process of identity changes. Do you see yourselves, people, as grieved and stuck in grief? Do you see yourselves, people, as broken down without a voice? Do you see yourselves, people, as just broken down people? Because if you do, and you're just hungry and thirsty to get over your grief, or to find your voice, or to get strong, here's how it's going to happen. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't hunger and thirst for Rome to be overthrown, don't hunger and thirst for some messiah that's going to come and be this army general. Don't hunger and thirst for a quick fix that's going to change everything in this world, but hunger and thirst for righteousness because that will change your identity. Children of God. You see, if you walk in here on any given Sunday and say, oh, I'm so-and-so, I'm going to come back and think, really, aren't you just a child of God? And as a child of God, do you not have a dad who owns the entire universe? Do you not have a dad who has created everything you see, so really you're, you're poor? Really, you have no voice? Really, the grief is overcoming your life in such a way that you can't move on when you know there's eternal life? Have you forgotten who you are? Has the world convinced you you are something less than everything you are as children of God? Because if that's the case, you're hungering and thirsting for things of this world and not for righteousness because the moment I get back right with God, I realize I'm his kid and he's not going to let me down. And all of a sudden, my identity changes. 
I'm not in that rad group or sad group or mad group or bad group. I'm not an addict. I'm not in recovery. I'm not a widow. I'm not a widower. I'm not rich. I'm not poor. I'm God's kid, period. And that's the basis I build for everything that I do in my life. That's how you become a saint, dear people of God. It's not that Rome said, you are a saint. I actually go to a bit higher authority, a little farther away than Italy. I go to heaven. And God has said, you are saints. Really, he knows what you do in the dark, so you're not really in his eyes. He gets it, you're sinful. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you are saints. Luther said we live in this really odd thing. We have a foot in being completely saint and a foot in being completely sinner at the same time. And Luther said we have to live with that. We are fully saint and fully sinner and just get used to it. But if you let the fully sinner convince you you are any less than saint, you're letting the lie of Satan tear you down. And if you think that you are better than the sinners because you're saint, you're letting the lie of Satan tear you down. You have to keep both. I am perfect, and I am screwed up at the same time. And Dr. Phil can't fix that because you are perfect and you are screwed up at the same time. And so just live with the identity that if I am thirsting to be perfect in this world, I am thirsting after the things of this world. If I am thirsting to get my sinful appetite filled, I am living in this world. If I am thirsting after righteousness, I get it. I screw up, but I'm also perfect, and that's called a child of God in this life. Heaven bound. Completely perfect, completely sinner at the same time, and don't think too much of that because it will drive you crazy. Just know that's how God sees you, and he's okay with it so you should be also. You're not so sinful that you're not a saint, and you are not so perfect that you're not a sinner. You're just right, kind of like Goldilocks. <laughs> and here's what Jesus goes on to say. When you have that hunger and thirst for righteousness, you begin to do things differently because you will begin to be merciful. Because when I realize that I am sinner and saint, and I see someone messing up over here, if I am hungering and thirsting for righteousness, my mind will say, how dare I criticize them when I am no different than they are? And yet the saint side will say, and yet how can I be merciful to them and show them mercy? I'm not going to judge, but I will be merciful. And mercy may not mean accepting, but mercy means not judging. And then you may actually go on and become pure at heart, which means all those things that you think you need to make you happy and all those things of the world that lure you into thinking you are identified as, as rad or sad or mad or bad, all those things that your mind goes to to feel complete, will be washed away because all I desire to be is a child of God. Realizing I'm a sinner, but I'm a saint. I don't need to be rad or bad or mad or sad to find my identity because my identity is in the child of God and my thoughts are about that. Become pure hearted. And when you have that mercy attitude and that pure of heart attitude, then you're able to be a peacemaker. Well, I don't want to make peace. I don't even like that person. Well, that person over there wronged me. I am not making peace with them until they step up and do something for me. Well, then come back and look at this identity change. Because it's not about me winning or losing. It's me being called to be a peacemaker and to bring wholeness. Peace just isn't peace out, man, it's all cool. Peace in Scripture is I bring wholeness and completeness 
when I enter a room or into my workplace? Do you bring a wholeness and a completeness and round out in a good way that which you are involved in? And if you don't, if you bring dissension and trouble and discord, don't show up because you're not helpful, nor are you a peacemaker. Well, I just have to stir the pot. No one's job in this world is to stir the pot. That's just you enjoying causing trouble. Well, I need to speak up for the difficult things. Get over it. No one needs to do that. Jesus spoke the truth. If the pot was stirred, it's because someone didn't like what he was saying, but he never went in to say, my calling is to disturb the peace. Trust me, you're not called to disturb the peace. If you get bringing peace right, then we can talk about how you can push the edge, but you're not there yet, so let's not go to volume two. Bring peace wherever you go. And then finally, when you get all that straight, and the people are listening going, I can have a new life, and I can be merciful even to Rome who is persecuting me, and I can be pure in heart and not just seek the carnal, lowly things of this world, and I can be merciful, I can be all of that. And Jesus says, yes, and when you are, guess what you get? Persecution. <laughs> That's what I want. Wow. Thanks, Jesus. He doesn't say when you get all this straight, you get a big old crown and life gets easy. When you get all this straight, you get a big old house and you can kick back. He goes, no, when you get it straight, you're going to be persecuted because the world's not going to get it. And don't worry about it because when you have all that straight, the world no longer matters. It doesn't matter what someone thinks about you if you know you're a child of God. It doesn't matter if someone looks down at you because of your faith when you know I'm a child of God. That no longer matters. And so just be prepared for it. If you're doing it right, there should be some persecution. Which means if you're not being persecuted, check yourself and where do you have to get some persecution going? <laughs> because if you're not being persecuted, you're ducking and covering from the truth. Because you know if you go in and bring peace, Someone's going to say, just stop going easy on them. Or if you go in and you're merciful to somebody, someone's going to say, they don't deserve mercy. You should be challenged for being merciful and a peacemaker and pure at heart. Because the world doesn't get it. And if you're not being challenged, step up your game. Saints of God. And then finally, if persecution isn't enough, then just ready to be reviled on account of Jesus. Oh, you're one of those. Jesus people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually am. And do you know what? Your thoughts about me mean zero to me because I'm going to heaven. Full stop. And I don't actually care what you think about me when I'm a child of God. I don't care how you look down on me because you know what? My Jesus is actually bigger than you, so huh. Why are we worried about the opinions of people when we worship a God who is bigger than anybody? And yet we're so worried that we may stick out or we may be reviled. But we don't go out there and win friends and influence enemies by being hateful and pointing fingers and picketing and boycotting and all that stuff because where is that under merciful, pure in heart, or peacemakers? You see, the Christian church has screwed this up. We think we should be loud and obnoxious in order to get Jesus identified with. That's not helpful. Merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. Let's try that for a century and see how that's working. Not just a day or two. Give it 100 years. See if it influences the world. Well, I tried being nice once and it didn't work. We're not patient because we're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness, which God says, I've got eternity. A couple hundred years, not a long time for me. Just keep doing what you're doing. Mercy, pure in heart, peacemakers, and see how that begins to change the world. 
You see, saints, these are our marching orders. We wonder, how do we become a saint? Well, it's not the Pope in Rome. It's following Jesus. And it's realizing we can shed that identity of mournful or, or grieving or poor in spirit or, or meek. And I can take on the identity of merciful and peacemaker and pure. That's who I am as a child of God. So if that was the case, and you leave here in just a little bit, or tomorrow at work, or by Wednesday when, you know, the, the thrill of Sunday wears off because it's Wednesday, what would it look like if you lived with a few less strings attached to this earth? What would not be so pressing on Wednesday if this world didn't matter quite as much as it does right now? If you could cut some strings, what would your life look like if you were more concerned about heaven than about earth? What would your life look like if when you were in a bind or when you were frustrated or when you were on the urge of going back to those old ways of poor in spirit or mourning or meek, your eyes were set on heaven rather than on what you don't have. It's set on what you have and is guaranteed that when Jesus appears, you will be like him and you know where you're headed. How would that change your attitude on Wednesday if you know Heaven is where I'm bound. That's where I'm going. This, this is one chapter in a really big eternal book. And I'm not letting this one chapter pull my eyes off of heaven. What would it look like, dear friends, if you walked into work or to your family or to your friendship circles by Wednesday and said, you know what? I'm only going to do things that bring peace. I'm only going to do things that reflect the purity I want to be in God. I'm only going to do things that are merciful. What would that change about you? And if you can't do that, maybe don't leave your house. Don't help us out as Christians and go out in the world and not do that. What would it look like if you prayed every morning before you walked out the door let me only be a conveyor of peace and purity and mercy. What would that look like for you? What would it look like for you on Wednesday if you were hungering after God? What would you do differently on Wednesday if you were hungering and thirsting for God? And what would it look like on Wednesday if you didn't identify as only mourning or only broken or only beaten down? What if you could leave that behind for everything else and live as a true child of God? That's how saints live. You don't have to be dead to be a saint. You just have to be peaceful and pure and full of mercy. So let's not wait until you're dead to sing about how great you are. Let's just begin to live as saints right now. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may that peace keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.